Dan. Hey, there's Angela. Perfect. There. How are you doing? I'm doing well. What, Angela, give me a second. I'm going to just <laughs> mute everyone and then unmute you, and then I'll be back in a sec. So. Sure. You're still there. Did I do that right? Let me see. Oh, wait. <laughs> there, now I muted you. Now I unmute you. Okay, everyone else is on mute. Um, we and I, you and I are talking. Um, I'm going to give a few minutes for people to kind of log in. We're getting, you know, people by the second that will be joining us, I'm sure. Um, so, these it, are people from MeetRx? Is that what it is? MeetRx members? Yeah, yeah. They'll be anywhere between, I don't know, 30 to 90 or something like that, depending on how many. Okay, cool. This is kind of an odd time, you know, as, you, as you're well aware. Um, no kidding. Um. I my <laughs> understanding, you know, is that we may undergo martial law here in California. Uh, potentially, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing that's going to happen. I know the military is being sort of, uh, you know, sort of asked to be ready to do that. So we'll see. I know the governor just ordered it, you know, kind of a stay at home type of thing. And so I think right. I think for the people that refuse to do that, the military will help them stay at home. So well, you can see Dexter in the traffic. It's there are a lot of yellows and reds still out there. I didn't expect to see that. Just yeah, no, I've I've got to go. I've got to go do a uh, thing, um, a medical thing with the family this morning. So I have to go see the go to see the physician. But uh, so we'll see how that goes traveling. So right after, directly right after this, in fact. <clears throat> Um, my neighbors were kind enough to smoke a brisket I had, so we get to interact with the <laughs> You guys cook it, we'll split it with you. So, anyway, I'm walking up to you, I just hop over. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you're not too far down the road. Uh, that, that may be prohibited activity right now. So, right. Um, well, let's let me introduce you, Angela, from what I because I know you you have a PhD and I believe in neuroscience, and you were I think that was in Germany, if I'm not mistaken, from when we interviewed you before. And you neuroeconomics over the last many years have sort of, you know, you'd suffer with migraine headaches yourself and have kind of worked and figured it out and have helped a lot of people. And I know you're using different dietary strategies and different electrolyte strategies to deal with uh, certainly migraines. And I think a few other maybe versions of headaches. So um, let me know if I left anything out, go ahead and just say hi and introduce yourself a little bit. And then uh, we'll get into chatting what kind of questions people might have in general. Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, the only thing that Sean, I think left out is that uh, my PhD is from the US. I just did my postdoc in Germany. Okay. And it's in neuroeconomics. So it's basically economics, uh, me economic methods using neuroscientific um, experiments. I was an experimental scientist and uh, I would use economic models to play games while uh, spraying some hormones into your nose. <laughs> <laughs> And migraines, I have been a lifetime migrainer and um, simply quit all my work teaching as well as Max Planck Institute in Germany uh, a little over 10 years ago by now uh, in order to put all my time into researching what this migraine thing is. So this is what brought me and Chant together some time ago. So let me just ask you, so when you say what this migraine thing is, obviously when we, when we the lay person thinks about migraines, we it's a headache, right? I mean, it hurts. It doesn't feel good. We've got something going on in our central nervous system. What, but what actually is occurring during a migraine? Do we know that now? Uh, I know that now. I don't know. if science, science is catching up. I'm starting to see some literature that actually discusses uh, chlor, uh, chloride clocks, which would be the movement of sodium uh, chloride. Uh, chloride is the one that's visible. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> I have a little bit of a, maybe I'm catching COVID. Who knows? Um, and so what actually is happening is uh, migraineurs are extremely sensitive to electrolyte imbalance. So if you're looking at the brain, um, it really is just a bunch of um, electrical firing left and right. And so for that, you need a lot of sodium, potassium, chloride. All of these are essential for the sodium potassium pumps to work. And it seems that for migraineurs, these are genetically uh, variants. So they're the mutants basically. And so what happens is, is that if we get out of electrolyte balance, meaning not enough sodium, not enough chloride, not enough potassium, we are not able to reset the balance and we are not able to fire. So the migraine itself is a consequence of a whole lot of chemical reactions that lead us to the state where we no longer can literally fire. And so that's why many of the migraineurs will have, say, um, 
part of their eyes, they won't be able to operate so much. They may have some paralysis of half of their lips, or they may not be able to work an arm. And those are the, the sections of the brain that are affected by the inability to fire. And so um, if they're looking at scanners, uh, special scanners like functional magnetic resonance imaging and similar scanners, they can actually see movements of a wave, which they recall, which they name cortical spreading depression. So they can actually see a huge voltage wave moving across the brain um, in order to sort of like a CRP, like when you have a heart attack and they pump voltage to you. So the goal of the brain is to start up electricity in that area. And so this cortical spreading depression can be seen sometimes as an aura. So migraineurs who have aura actually visualize this from inside their brain. It's a funky thing to do. And so um, if this is, is successful for the brain, uh, meaning this, the flux, the chloride flux and the sodium flux is successful and the voltage was able to be reestablished at the area where there wasn't any, then there won't be any pain. Those are the oral migraines that uh, typically don't come with pain. So not all migraines come with a headache. And those that do end up in a pain are the ones where the brain was not able to recover and um, then additional steps need to be taken, like taking salt. This is part of my protocol to uh, get the brain moving again. So, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is you need, it's almost has some similarities with seizure-like activity with, you know, yeah. some auras, uh, you know, weird lights in their eyes, different smells, different sensations. Right. Um, and one of the things we see with seizures, obviously most people know at this point that, that, that from a dietary standpoint, people treat those with ketogenic diets. Obviously, there's lots of med medicines out there that are, used, that are used to stabilize membranes, a lot of these anti-seizure medications. And so uh, I know that you have used diet as well as electrolyte supplementation. So talk a little bit about, well, um, you know, one of the things we see with adaptation to low-carbohydrate diets, many people will see, you know, electrolyte shifts, and consequently, they'll have, they'll have headaches. I know when I started, when I first went on, Genic and a carnivorous diet, I had just a mild low grade headache for like two weeks, and I'm sure it was due to electrolyte, uh, you know, alterations that were occurring. And so, how does diet impact this migraine uh, membrane, you know, uh, you know, membrane potentials, electrolyte shifts, uh, and what are you what are you doing with your clients that have migraines? Okay, so <clears throat> this is a very important question. And um, I have to apologize for my voice, but it's coming and going. <clears throat> but basically what actually nutrition does and why the ketogenic approach or the carnivore approach or any kind of approach where we basically cut carbohydrates out is the way it helps and the way it hurts is because of the electrolytes. So let me back up and explain how carbohydrates change electrolytes. And that's a very important point because most of us are so trained on eating carbohydrates all the time prior to our <clears throat> uh, ketogenic or carnivore diet, that our brain is set up to continuously have to deal with the incoming glucose. And if you're looking at what studies show, when glucose enters the cells, it actually kicks out sodium and water. So this is a big problem. This is not acknowledged nearly anywhere, but it's in every medical book. So we know very well that this is happening. Um, but it's not uh, understood what it does to the brain. Now, for a person who doesn't have those sodium potassium pumps um, genetically changed, uh, there's not much of a problem because it's an easy to reset situation. So the sodium and, and uh, water was released. And so, okay, so uh, it will be able to reset it on its own. But in a migraine brain, it can't. And so if the migrainer eats carbohydrates, the glucose will remove sodium and water from um, the, the brain in a sufficient amount enough to disturb the electrolyte balance to the point that it can lead to a migraine. And so where diet comes into the picture is that if we move to a diet that is void of carbohydrates, in the case of uh, um, carnivore diet, I mean nearly void because we can eat carbohydrates such as shellfish and so forth. But generally speaking, those are going to be not the same effect because we're eating it together with fat and protein, and they're not in the same uh, digestive mode as just eating an apple. 
Um, but if a migraineur eats a heavy carbohydrate diet, then the migraine is nearly unavoidable because of the re removal of the sodium and also water. And so what happens in this case very specifically is that the water that is kicked out from the cell, it enters edema places. So you can then see people with swollen ankles. It's very typical for people with type 2 diabetes to have swollen ankles, to have general systemic edema. And that's because of all the glucose, it's not necessarily from the food they eat. And this is where we come to, um, for example, you changing from a, a sad diet to a carnival diet. It doesn't need to come from the food you eat. It can also be the liver releasing glycogen because that too is glucose entering the cells. So if you have an unhealthy liver, for example, and you release uh, glucose in an unlikely uh, fashion, so too often, which is also typical for type two diabetic, uh, diabetic patients, then you're going to continue to experience the edema and the release of the sodium and the water from your cells. So it's a continuous cycle until you reach the stage, uh, state of health, metabolic health, where it no longer happens. So when you switch, there could be an electrolyte imbalance because of this. It's an internally driven problem that sort of kind of resolves. So do you see, Angela, do you see uh, people resolving diet, you know, uh, resolving migraines just on diet alone, or does it always require some sort of electrolyte uh, manipulation? I mean, outside of the dietary manipulation, do you have to supplement? What's your thoughts? Right. I suppose it depends upon how badly they're affected genetically. Uh, what I have so far found is that for most people, we do need to supplement sodium, but I've only had so far about 7,000 patients that I've been dealing with, so maybe the 7,001 will be different. But so far, it seems that even on the said diet, eating a lot of carbohydrates, and even on the vegan diet, which is a lot of carbohydrates, um, they may not be able to prevent all their migraines, but as long as they supplement salt, they can reduce its occurrence and also can reduce the length of time for which a migraine may last because some of them last, usually they last three to four days. So if they take salt, even with a carbohydrate, rich carbohydrate diet, it will reduce the migraine occurrence frequency as well as the intensity. Uh, you know, one of the criticisms of a standard American diet is, you know, all the processed foods it has a lot of sodium in it. And when you remove that, you remove a lot of the sodium. How much sodium are you talking about? I know some people talk about as much as, uh, you know, uh, 10 grams a day. Uh, what, are your, what are your typical numbers looking like for supplementation for migraine? What we so far found is most people start at about uh, five, 6,000 uh, uh, milligrams sodium, but most of them eventually get up there to 8,000. We have members who take 10,000. Uh, I am probably at about 7,000, four to six, four to six, 7,000, and if I work out, then 8,000 or more milligram sodium a day. So it's much more than the average. Yeah. And so can you just put that in terms of household measurements? Because a lot of people can't visualize what 10, sure. uh, that's, that's, you know, as far as teaspoons or something like that would be. And, and there's a lot of variance in that too, because it depends on the salt type. Right. So if you get a very fine salt, which is like your standard table salt, uh, then uh, 2,400 milligram sodium is about one teaspoon. Yeah. And so when we're talking about 8,000, we're talking about three and a half, four teaspoons of salt uh, yeah. a day. And so it's important that you brought up the said diet. If somebody is eating a said diet, meaning there's a lot of salt with carbohydrates, because carbohydrates, when they convert to glucose, kick sodium out, whatever salt you're eating with the carbohydrates will be removed. So that salt is not helpful. So for those, um, I have three um, protocols for my migraineurs. One of them is a carnivore, one is a ketogenic, and one is a, a low carb, high fat. And so the low carb, high fat still eats quite a bit of carbs. And so they don't eat salt with the food. They have to eat it after and no water. So what it actually does then, it brings the, so the sodium is recovered. So it brings all the water back in from the edema, which then can empty as urination easily. So it reduces that problem and it also recharges the body because it offers additional sodium. But if they take it with water, again, it's just going to go to the wrong place. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they think about hydration, you know, we have to realize that there's osmotic gradients that, you know, the right. fluid and the salt have to sort of equalize. And so when we drink a lot of fluid and we don't have enough electrolyte, it kind of right. doesn't stay where it's supposed to stay a lot of times. So. And it can actually even dehydrate you because if you're 
the, the RAAS system of the kidney, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, will actually remove the excess sodium. So you need to also be cautious about the sodium potassium balance because if you have too much sodium with not enough sodium, not enough potassium, the RAAS system will remove the sodium and will also remove water. So you're dehydrating in the process. And the same with the potassium, if you have too much potassium and not enough sodium, uh, your kidneys will remove the excess potassium with water, so you will be dehydrated. So it's just drinking water is going to imbalance everything, and it will definitely just further dehydrate because it will remove a little bit of sodium and potassium as well. Let me, I'm, I'm going to get to these questions, guys, in a second. I want one more thing. Just what do you do with the folks that are hypertensive, that uh, so have high blood pressure, migraines at the same time? How do you manage their electrolytes? Because there's some thought that some people are salt sensitive, not everyone. Is, but some are. So how do you how do you deal with that situation? Okay, so I've had so far up to seven thousand people I had worked with. Two people who had salt sensitivity, and uh, one of them decided to just try and go on uh, uh, the carbohydrate reduction diet and start everything. And actually, the salt sensitivity disappeared. So the question is whether the salt sensitivity is the outcome of the said diet, or is it really a salt sensitivity? And um, another thing that I have to say is that so far I have found, based on just these two people that I have so far found, and all the others have actually very low blood pressure. And we have been, I have been taking this tremendous amount of sodium for the past five years, or actually more than that, and my blood pressure didn't increase at all. So if you're eating a healthy diet, and by that I mean a species-specific healthy diet, so not much carbohydrates, the salt is not going to cause trouble. Yeah, I mean, there's some evidence that some people think it's sugar inflammation in general. So let me, let me get to the question here, Andrew. Somebody's asking, uh, this is from Charlotte, saying, could you discuss a little bit more about dairy? Does it have a favorable effect in migraines? Because she seems to remember seeing it from our, our interview we did earlier. What's the thought on dairy and migraines? Okay, so uh, that's a very good question. Thank you. There are two kinds of people. There are those who are lactose intolerant and those who are lactose tolerant. So if you're looking at the general population, over 80% are lactose intolerant. But if I'm looking at the micronerve population, it seems to be the other way around. Most of them are lactose tolerant. So if you're lactose tolerant, you should be able to enjoy having dairy. Dairy has um, pro provided this to proper dairy, meaning it is a whole fat and you try to get the A2 kind protein um, milk so that it is not uh, full of A1, which is uh, the inflammatory uh, protein. So if you are able to drink milk and you enjoy it, it has a lot of benefits because it's an electrolyte. It has a little bit more potassium than sodium, so some people will balance that out with sodium, but it's, a, it's actually a tool to use for pressure changes. So if the pressure rises very fast, then you need to increase potassium really quickly. We don't supplement potassium. We just have to get it from the food. Drinking milk is an extremely good way of doing that. So we recommend it. Yeah, I want to just follow up on potassium because people can get in trouble if they try to supplement potassium. They're right. able to overdo that and you can end up with heart arrhythmias and you can have problems. So you have to be very mindful of taking too much potassium there, so you have to be careful. Now, this is a question from um, Phil. It's just another electrolyte question. He says, you know, I know you're talking about sodium, uh, but he's talking about migraines, leg cramps. Um, how do we know if it's maybe magnesium, potassium? Is there a way to assess that? Yes, there is actually. Um, this is from my experience and some of the people that I work with that leg cramps are always actually sodium, not enough sodium. And um, the way to actually test that is that if it were potassium, then instead of having a cramp that you couldn't release, it would release because the function of the potassium is actually the reverse of the sodium. Sodium is the action potential where it actually pumps up. So if you have a cramp, it's a pumped up, it's really stiff. Whereas if it were potassium, it would be released. It would be the other way around. Uh, magnesium can participate in a migraine because magnesium is responsible for opening the sodium potassium gates. Uh, attached to an ATP. So that can in fact be a factor. And so um, migraineurs are extremely sensitive to magnesium. So for example, we don't recommend uh, migraineurs to take magnesium at night because it's an excitatory uh, mineral as a result of it attaching the ATP and opening and closing the, the gates, the sodium pumps, uh, sodium potassium pumps. So there has to be a balance between sodium and magnesium a lot more. And it seems that 
potassium is not wasted by the body nearly as much as sodium and magnesium is. So if you have cramps, try to add sodium. We have so far not found anybody for whom it was a potassium that was needed for that. It was always sodium or sometimes very rarely magnesium. Okay, well, hopefully that helps some people out. I know some people try a lot of things. This is just a comment from Kelsey Faye saying she has hereditary hemophilia. She's had migraine aura since age, migraines and aura since age 10. Carnivore helped her out so much. She never has pain anymore. It took a year to get blood clotting issues. So good for her. Um, we'll find some more. Uh, Michael's just asking, what's your dietary? Are you doing a carnivore diet right now? Just out of personal, personal things. Okay, I can, I can respond to that. I actually tried all the diets and I tried to be seasonal. Uh, but it doesn't always work out this way. And what I did and what I recommend other people do is to get your blood test all through. So have a diet, say ketogenic, and then do that for maybe three, four months and then get a blood test, including NMR for your cholesterol. So you can see the particle counts and sizes to see if they change favorably. Um, then go switch to uh, carnivore, then go to hypercarnivore, where you're allowed to eat a little bit of maybe a pickle every now and then or, or so forth and check what works for you. For me, it seems the hypercarnivore is the best solution um, and the ketogenic. So I tend to have a better, a more favorable um, um, markers in all respect if I'm doing that. So yeah, for really people that don't, the hypercarnivore is basically 70% of your diet is coming from meat. That's sort of the... It's actually probably more, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very high protein. So I'm eating uh, mostly uh, a lot of meat, also eat a lot of organ, um, organ meats. And I eat a ton of eggs. Um, I don't add fat too much, except I really love my butter on my steak. Don't ask, don't know why. I just happen to love butter on my steak. And I'm eating really fatty steak, which is like the ribeye and cap. So it's um, fantastic. And I put sometimes bone marrow on top of it. It's really a fatty meal. But I will have a couple of little, uh, the mini peppers uh, with my uh, first meal. And then I may have a few strawberries and raspberries usually with some actually protein powder. Uh, mixed in with some 100% uh, dark chocolate ground into it. it. It really is a treat every day. So that's about all, and I have milk. So that's about all the carbs that I eat. I don't really carb up or don't cheat or anything. I have no need for that. All right, perfect. So this is from Tracy asking about, I don't know if you want to comment on cluster headaches. She's saying, what's going on with a cluster headache? Um, and she, she, some of her friends have been giving something called a gamma core machine, which I not aware of what that is, but what's, what's... I, yeah, I don't know what a gamma core machine is. I assume it's a, a machine that uh, puts out electrical charge. I'm not quite sure, but cluster headache is a little bit different. It uh, most most often it's misdiagnosed. Cluster headache is a pain inside the eye, so it's not a headache. It's actually a pain inside the eye. It's a stabbing pain, and it's often referred to as eye spick headaches because of the stabbing nature of it. And each stab can last just maybe a couple of seconds, but the, the entire period can last for a whole month, nonstop. Uh, usually it doesn't. Uh, what I found is that there is a benefit from a reduced carbohydrate diet. Um, I have some migraineurs who have both cluster as well as migraine and their clusters have disappeared. Um, I would be hesitant to say that a person who only has clusters would respond the same way because I never experienced that. Uh, this is just from Justin, I guess, maybe on your form or something says his name is all out carnivore. Uh, he's saying, thank you for saving my life. And want to know how research is going on cluster and tension, tension headaches, kind of redundant question, but he just wanted to say thanks. Let's go to Terry. Hi, Justin. Yes, good for you. <laughs> <laughs> he said, can you speak at all to heart rhythm issues, specifically palpitations or PVCs? Uh, he says that he or she, I'm not sure, Terry, but says it is much improved on carnivore. Right, so there are a couple of factors associated with that. And a lot of migraineurs find that they have some form of palpitations or arrhythmia, I am one of them as well. And it completely stops, not just from the carnivore or the keto diet, but actually it seems that, I don't know how familiar you are with the vitamin B1 thiamine, which requires a transporter to get into the cells. Um, thiamine is a water soluble, um, vitamin, but it has to cross into the cell membrane, which is lipid. So it needs to have a transporter. And for a lot of people, most migraineurs for that matter, I would say over 50%, so far we found that they're not able to have 
B1 cross the membrane, so they lack transporters. So what the way we found this out, we didn't know. But the way we found this out is we chose the B1 that is considered to be fat soluble. It really isn't fat soluble, but it it comes with the transporter, so to speak. Um, this would be there are two kinds um, that you can buy predominantly in the United States. One is called alithiamine or thiamine, I don't know how you pronounce that, and the other one is lipothiamine. And so these two are pretty pricey. You you really can't find them in most stores. You have to get them on Amazon. They also cross the blood-brain barrier. There are some other types like benfotiamine and so forth, which don't cross the blood-brain barrier. So we use these two kinds. And what we found is that, and what I also found, is that if you have a heart arrhythmia that was caused as a result of not enough B1 in your system, then first you're going to end up with idiopathic response. So you're um, heart arrhythmia or, or um, any kind of palpitations will increase. Sometimes even anxiety increases a little bit. Everything that uses B1, your nervous system, as well as your heart, may actually get worse a little bit. So then what that means is just stay with it. And within about a couple of weeks, everything is going to disappear. You may also feel very sleepy and tired at the beginning. I, I was, for me, it was like a sleeping pill when I first took it. And then after about two, three weeks, everything returns to normal and I increased the dose. And I increased the dose to the point that I could see that I still get this idiopathic response. And so a one dose is 50 milligrams, which is about 50 times of the, the RDA. But for some of us, that is what was required. So I would keep on increasing this alithiamine until my idiopathic response stopped. So I am now taking three of those. I have no heart arrhythmia. I was able to come off of my heart medication with that. Many people, palp palpitation stops, anxiety stops, so we can come off of our benzodiazepines or whatever else we take for anxiety, because all of that stops. So it's a lack of a simple vitamin. Okay, so here's another question <laughs> uh, from Charlotte. Just it's another question of raw milk, and does uh, does it have to be A2, or does pasteurized homogenized milks have different effects when you're talking about dairy benefiting migrainers? Does, does it need okay, to be so, two? Right. So the A2 versus raw, um, you can have raw milk that is A1, A2. So the A2 is more important than whether it is raw or not raw. Um, I drink only um, pasteurized because I don't have raw milk in A2 available to me, and I prefer the A2, even if it's pasteurized, than the, uh, the raw milk if it has A1. So I would recommend that you consider the inflammatory um, protein over whether it's raw or not. Okay. Um, yeah, somebody was asking about how thiamine for, for vitamin uh, B1. And, uh... I Here's from Phil, uh, he's asking about, is there a relationship with histamine intolerance and, and electrolytes, or is there any relationship there? Okay, so there have been a lot of discussions about histamine. There are some foods that have histamine in them, but usually not much. I mean, we're looking at fermented foods that will have histamine in them. Most of the foods that are fermented by any means, even an avocado. We don't eat the avocado straight up the tree because it's hard. We wait until it softens and ripens. So that's a fermenting process. So the histamine will, will develop from the bacteria that uh, or the yeast that are doing the fermentation. So if you avoid those foods, then you're not going to have a histamine issue. In terms of other foods, like people say, well, milk has a lot of histamines. I don't think it has any histamines. Histamines is your own body. That's your own immune system, putting up histamines in reaction to something that you're eating that your body finds to be too foreign or, or uh, is not happy with it. So if you want to reduce your reaction, <clears throat> your histamine reaction, uh, we found that if you simply cut out those foods that truly bother you. However, uh, there is a counter movement here because some of the foods, for example, grain, which none of us eats, but I just want to bring it up as an example. It will trick you. It will make you think that you may be allergic to X, for example. But when you stop grain, then you will find out you're not allergic to X. Your allergy was basically to the grain, but it was just so huge that it's affected other foods as well. So you need to sort of do a, a total um, removal of all potential irritants. So the, the carnivore diet is perfect because it has nothing in it 
like an irritate you. <clears throat> there are some organs perhaps that will contain some parts that will irritate you, but not necessarily. So having a carnivore diet is your best cleanse, so to speak. So you're cleaning off your system from all allergens and then try to eat the food that you used to find as a um, histamine activating agent and see if you still have the reaction to it. <clears throat> and you may find you don't have any reaction to it. <laughs> All right, let me see if we've got another question here, guys. <laughs> He's asking about, well, I, I, my Carl is asking about sodium pre-workout. Does it temporarily increase strength or is this a placebo effect? I don't know if you want to comment on that. If you do, if not, I can comment on that. I'm not you sure. can comment on it, but I do have experience with that and it, it's not a placebo effect. So absolutely increases performance in my experience. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that has to do with a uh, just hydration, intervascular water, intermuscular water effect. You, I think you're more efficient with more water in the muscle as way. Uh, and I've, looked, I've read, read some studies on that, so I think it does help. And I do that as well. I mean, usually before I train, I, I load up on a little bit of salt and water, and uh, it seems to help pretty well. Um, what else we got here? Okay, here's a question just in general. Can you comment on coffee? Does it negatively, positively affect uh, I think you got muted, Angela. Let me unmute you. Oh, you're muted. Okay, cool. Thanks. Right. So did you hear the question? Just somebody's no. asking about coffee. <laughs> okay, coffee. So coffee, uh, we use actually as medicine. So if you look at some of the medicines that you can get for migraine and stored, like say Excedrin, they uh, succeed because there's co caffeine in them. Caffeine is a vasoconstrictor. So if you're not hydrated properly, caffeine is going to up make your blood relatively more. So it's going to constrict your blood vessels and it's going to make your blood vessels um, tight enough to allow the blood to go a little bit faster. This is the, also the increase of uh, your blood pressure uh, as a result of this. So it has the benefit if you can't access any kind of water or uh, for your hydration and salt, you can have uh, coffee instead, but it's a temporary solution because it doesn't actually provide you with the electrolytes or the fluids. It provides you with a fake solution where you've restricted the avenue in which your blood traverses, and therefore it appears like you have more blood when you don't. So it's best to have the, the coffee and then right after that, um, hydrate with salt and water. All right, so... Somebody's, uh, I guess Justin's asking about research again. Did, is there some research you're actually participating in? Is that, is that being done or, or is there some sort of research you're involved with? No, not at the moment. Uh, there may be in the future. There are some doctors who are interested to cooperate with me, uh, but I'm not quite sure how to actually do that because um, this is akin to uh, somebody in nutritional studies where they will have to move people off of their nutrition and move them on to a different kind. But here we also have the caveat of the medicines. So they haven't talked about that, but a lot of migraines are on medications and all of those have to eventually be tapered off for the electrolytes to actually work. Many of them block sodium, potassium, so forth. <laughs> this is just another general question, a couple, couple questions on general questions on electrolytes and they're asking, uh, I think ratios on salt to water, and then if we include magnesium and potassium, um, is there a ratio that you, if somebody's including all of those or, or just salt that you like to see water to salt and salt to potassium to magnesium? Okay, so we don't supplement potassium, so that already automatically is out. Uh, magnesium we take separately. You can, magnesium half-life is a couple of days, so you, you don't have to take it like a time release or anything like that, and you don't, <clears throat> you don't have to include it in your water. It's okay for you to take all of them at once in the morning. The half-life is, I think, two days or something. So if you even, if you miss a day, the next day you still have plenty of magnesium in you. Um, we only do sodium and water. So um, this is an arbitrary number uh, that we bumped into uh, as a trial and error uh, to see how it works. And it seems that one eighth of a teaspoon of salt, which comes with 300 milligrams sodium, seems to be ideal um, to take per eight ounces of glasses of water. Now, some people may find this too much and be reduced to half, and some people may increase, which is fine. <clears throat> this is fine, one eighth teaspoon to be 
totally ideal. So if you, um, they also found that a lot of people can't salt the water because it's just not a good feeling afterwards. Like I can't, I can't, I don't like the taste. So then we use capsules. So you can create your own capsule or you can buy electrolyte capsules. So I designed one, which I don't sell. I'm not affiliated with the company, but if you're sensitive, you can uh, take that. If you make your own, then weigh the salt because it has to be by weight because uh, by size, like if you take uh, Himalayan salt, which I don't recommend by the way, these are huge crystals. So you may just be able to put one in there, but it may not be the right weight. So measure the 600 milligrams sod uh, sodium uh, of what that is. So that's about what, about uh, 700 milligram salt. So you measure 700 milligram salt, it's going to be about 600, 300 milligram sodium. All right, so let me just scroll through and get a couple more questions if we have any here. Um, and that was commenting and saying 4,700 milligrams of potassium is perhaps too much. I don't know, is that the, R is that, I think that's the RDA, if I'm not. They have reduced it actually. It went down to 3,700 for men and 3,500 for women, I think now they changed it. Okay. Um, someone, Kelsey, is commenting on psychedelics. I mean, is that anything you've looked into? Does that have any, uh, any role in migraine or cluster headaches? Uh, do we... uh, it may cause one. I don't know. Uh, we have some people who have used it, but it's not helpful because an electrolyte imbalance cannot be resolved by psychedelics. So you may not notice that you have an electrolyte imbalance and you're happy about it, but your migraine is ongoing. Okay. Um, do you know, any, are you familiar with something called Redmond Real Salt? Have you, are you familiar with that? Yes, is that, right. is that yes, I am. And some, yeah, I can see somebody showing, showing something in the image. Yes, uh, Redmond Salt is, is okay. Um, it is an, an ancient salt, it's in the salt mine, so it's not in the ocean now, but it is with, it was coming from the sea. So if you're looking at sea, um, and be it today's sea or um, 2000 years ago sea, uh, would you ever take a glass of seawater and drink it? Just consider for a second of what's in there. There's a lot of organic matter, fish poop, um, dead material. And so when you're looking at these salts, they basically were evaporated. These are the Redmond salt was evaporated naturally by the sun. And so these organic matters were not removed and may not even have been deactivated. Uh, the same problem with uh, many of the current modern so-called tea salts that are not purified. And so if you eat a little bit, time to time for a fancy dish, no problem. But if you're taking um, 8,000 milligrams of sodium a day, that may become a problem. So I recommend that for this con continual use of sodium, whether it be it in a capsule or, or just taking it in a glass of water, that it should be really a purified salt. And so the purified salts are unfortunately those that are bleached and they're also heated. But that ensures that you don't have microplastics, you don't have any organic matters, you don't have anything on them that you don't want in your body. Now the argument is that a lot of salts, including the Redmond salt, has some trace minerals. But we don't actually need the trace minerals because we get them, we take magnesium supplement. If you're just depending on the trace minerals on the salt, it's too small, it's not enough. Our food today is not eating enough magnesium it's spelled for us to receive the magnesium from them. And also the plants we grow, they're growing in a dead soil. So if you consider all uh, the variables here, it is good to have Redmond salt. And I actually have one version, which is a red wine Redmond salt, which is really lovely wine taste. I will put it on something special if I want to have that kind of flavor, but I will not be eating that all day long. No, I will have purified salt. All right, um, and then let me go back here. What about, um, is there any, any thoughts on uh, Himalayan pink salt? Is that yes. work better? That's actually a, a very loaded question. And I've had a lot of argument with a lot of people about <laughs> that because a lot of people love Himalayan pink salt. And I think it's an amazingly marketed product and I'm not fighting with the marketing, but there's absolutely nothing in that salt that differs from other salts. So we have to understand that salt is sodium and chloride. And that's all we need because the moment we take salt and it enters our, our body, it completely disassociates into chemical parts. So whatever uh, they tell you for all the nutrients actually in the Himalayan salt, there's lead, mercury, there's uh, arsenic, a whole lot of 
um, bad materials that you really don't want to eat. Again, if you go to a restaurant and they serve a meal and you put a little Himalayan salt on it once in a blue moon, it's not going to harm you. It's okay, but there's no safe lead levels, right? And there's no safe mercury levels. So why would I want to eat something that I know has lead and mercury on it? It's on the label. Uh, I have a, um, a blog article on it where I took a, a laboratory an analysis, which is online. So if you go to cluelessdoctors.com, then you can search for Himalayan salt. You're going to find my article titled, What Salt Are You Eating? And that details uh, with a link to the website that did the analysis to the lab, a huge list of what's in there. And a lot of the material in there is actually hot radioactive. So why would you take a radioactive substance? So I have a lot of questions and problems with taking Himalayan salt. I don't recommend it at all, ever. Okay. Um, and this is another question from Carl about, is there, you know, within, I guess, red meat, is there a balance of sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium that supplementation is not required? And I, I don't know if this is just directly to migrainers or to the general population. But As a general population, but I find a lot of discussions also for migrainers. So I don't recommend supplementation of calcium at all, unless your test shows that you need calcium. Uh, you can get plenty of calcium from what you eat. You can have sardines under the, the carnivore diet with bones in it. You can have tuna with, or um, canned salmon with bones in it. You have bone broth. You can overcook it and eat some of the bones, like chicken bones. I eat the bones. Uh, so you can get your calcium supplemented that way um, regularly, even if you don't have dairy. And if you have dairy, you'll get your calcium. Supplementing calcium on its own outside of that, if you don't need it, can cause more harm than good. And if you're supplementing it wrong, even if you need it, can cause more harm than good. So there is a trick to supplementing calcium the proper way, but I only recommend to supplement it, and I'm sure Sean agrees, if it's medically necessary. So have a DEXA scan or a bone density scan, see if you need it. And if you do, then in addition to supplementing that and increasing your protein, because don't forget that 40% of your bones is actually protein, uh, also do a whole lot of exercises that are higher impact, weightlifting, uh, jumping up and down, whatever, running, jogging is going to increase your bone strength. So if you need it, do those things. Okay. Yeah, I, I would just echo that um, it's, it's almost, you never see somebody with like a serum calcium deficiency. We maintain that. So it's hard to assess it outside of maybe osteopenia, osteoporosis, right. and those things. Protein also, higher protein diets also upregulate our absorption of exactly. Gut. So uh, I would agree with not having to, you know, supplement with any kind and, of- And by the way, I had a confirmation of this with one migrainer who had a very serious osteopenia. And then she had it rechecked a year later and she had significant improvement on the carnivore diet. She's on a carnivore diet and she's supplementing calcium, but she's supplementing with a range of other supplements to make sure that it goes the right place and the right way. <clears throat> yeah, and there's this Kelsey. Kelsey is commenting that she got calcium deposits in her tissues on a vegan that's diet. Bad. Yeah, yeah that, that's I don't know if that was how that they were confirmed as calcium or uh, perhaps maybe even, I don't know, gouty tofi, perhaps. Who knows? Anyway, Annette's saying she's using calcium citrate to bind oxalates. Uh, and using vitamin D3 and krill oil, so, so it goes to your bones and not the heart valve. Are you, do you have any concerns, or I know we're having Sally Norton come on, I think, next week, but do you have any thoughts or concerns on oxalate consumption is in regard to, I don't know, does it affect uh, electrolyte flux? And I mean, it, obviously, oxalates bind to certain minerals. Uh, does it have any impact on uh, migrainers? Uh, not really. And if you move on a carnivore diet, uh, you're actually on a low oxalate, lowest oxalate diet possible. On a ketogenic diet, you have to be careful. A lot of people overload on a very high oxalate foods like almonds and like having almond bread and stuff like that. So these uh, imitation foods typically are very harmful. So I would recommend that um, uh, if you're sensitive to oxalates, stick with a carnivore diet, which I believe only the liver has some level of oxalates of concern, but it shouldn't be. And so there is what uh, Sally is going to talk about would be the oxalate dumping. And that's independent uh, of how much oxalate you're actually eating now. That is how much you ate in your past. And so that could be a concern, but it's not migraine specific. Okay. Um, what, um, 
there's not another question at the moment, but I'm just going to say what, uh, with regards to headaches and migraines, uh, well, here we go. We got Charlotte. Is there, is there a beginner migrainer protocol? Do you have like, is there, is there, is a way you kind of walk? Is there a transition, transition program to yes. do this? Yes, happen? there is. So my original protocol, which I call the protocol, and which is a low carb high fat. So uh, everybody who's coming into our group on Facebook, for example, I have two groups. There's a keto group and there's a protocol group. They're, everybody who's new has to come into the protocol group and we evaluate whether they're ready to go ketogenic or carnivore. Uh, and that's because <clears throat> migraineurs have a very different metabolic system from non-migraineurs. So we react to metabolic changes extremely differently. And so the beginning protocol is what I call the baseline. And so we have, uh, if, you're, if you're interested, join the migraine group. Um, and you're gonna find that the baseline basically means you need to catch up on drinking the right amount of water. You need to increase your salt. You need to cut out all grains, all carbohydrates um, that are high starch and grown below the ground. And also um, foods that people don't realize that are, that are um, high in carbohydrates because they're not sweet, like potatoes and other kind of things. Uh, you need to also cut out all juices, all teas. Um, Migraineurs have a really bad dehydrating response to teas. And we also get sugar spiked by coffee, even if it's just a black coffee. So we have to be careful with those. So we restrict to minimum coffee and uh, no tea at all, no juices, no shakes, unless it's a protein shake, and which is unsweetened and unflavored, and preferably in milk if you can. Uh, water is fine. Uh, and Or wrapped around fruit like, like I do, which I really enjoy. Uh, so there is what is called the baseline. And in the baseline, we apply the, the low carb high fat, which is 60% fat. Uh, we recommend only animal fats. So you can have some other fat like olive or avocado oil or coconut oil cold, but not heated. And uh, lots of, the, there will be about 20% to 26% protein depending upon your activity and the remainder will be carbohydrates. But for migraineurs, we restrict the carbohydrates under the, this low carb high fat for females between 50 to 70 grams and that's net carb grams. And for males, I believe it is 65 to 85. So it's a little bit more for men. And we find that every single person even from this diet falls into ketosis. And so I created this diet to prevent that because of the medications that interact. A lot of migraineurs are on psychotropics and heart medications that can interact. Topamax is already FDA labeled to interact. And so I was hoping that nobody would fall into ketosis from the low carb high fat, but everybody does, but just at a low level. So that's the starter. And um, I also require everybody to measure their blood ketones and blood glucose. This is totally essential for migraineurs, not so perhaps for other people, but for migraineurs it is because migraineurs tend to have huge sugar crashes down to 50s in uh, milligram per deciliter and uh, tend to have huge ketone runaways where the ketones of, even with high blood glucose go toward upwards of four, five, seven. So that's a minimal. And so we want to make sure we control everything um, in a diet. So this is the starter. Um, here's one more question about iodine. Do we need to supplement iodine if we're only using purified salt? I recommend you do. Of course, it's depending upon whether you have Hashimoto's or Graves' disease, so you need to consult with your doctor. Um, but I recommend that if you're completely healthy otherwise and you don't have your thyroid compromised in any which way, that you do supplement iodine. So we all do. Uh, there's uh, some evidence that iodine is needed not just for thyroid, but also for uh, memory glands and other functions in the body. We have a lot of uh, iodine receptors. And so uh, we all increase iodine. And many people, for example, had breast pains, it disappeared. Uh, some people even had ov ovary problems that disappeared. So I am not familiar enough to know where exactly all the iodine receptors are, but it seems that it is an extremely essential product. I don't say, think that it's uh, migraine specific. I think it's more specific perhaps because we eat more salt and we eat iodized salt. So we take in more iodine so we notice the benefits better. Yeah, I, you know, I just say that for certain uh, seafood is 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 an eye, source of iodine. So right. That are worried about that shellfish can be a 
right? And kelp, if somebody like I, for example, take the supplement iodine that I take, is, is actually kelp. Um, here's one question. I think I, I know the answer to this, but I'll just ask it anyway. So Charles asking, do migrainers often or generally come, are able to come off medications when they, when they adopt this sort of protocol? They all do. Uh, we generally ask them to not start before they reach the baseline, which I was uh, reported earlier. So if you reach the proper hydration and change your food properly and you start feeling comfortable, meaning you feel that you have a lot less prodromes, which you haven't talked about it, which are the precursors to migraines. If you have a lot less of those and you no longer have migraines per se, um, then you can talk to your doctor and see if a taper is possible. And we found that so far, every single person tapered off of every single medication that was prescribed for migraine, not necessarily for other things, but we're talking about migraine only. And um, some people were able even to taper off of other things like heart medications that were given for heart um, or psychotropics that were given for anxiety because all these things tend to disappear. They're all part of the migraine process. Uh, if you read my book, you're going to read about a hormonal cascade, which starts with an anxiety that releases a bunch of glucose and that leads basically to the migraine. And it all starts because of our super duper hypersensory organ sensitivity. So we respond to a noise or a bright light excessively. And so we release these special hormones. So, so we have a bigger response to that. So we, we take medicines for things other than migraine. But once you're on the proper diet for you, be it keto or carnivore, um, then you're going to find you won't need those anymore. So, so far, everybody has come off of every medication. Okay, I think this, somebody, uh, somebody's asking about sort of, you know, because you, you mentioned a genetic predisposition to migraine. Has that been identified? Do we have any genetic markers that say this person is prone to migraines versus someone else? Right. I think that there is a, there are, tremendous amount of genetic literature on migraine. And it seems that the most recent literatures that I see are all are around the calcium channel, sodium, potassium, calcium. So all of the um, channelopathy type, this is why I call migraine a channelopathy. It seems that those are the genetic variants that are uh, there and you can't really have a migraine unless you have these. So it is genetic, it, it is passed on, it may skip generation, but it is passed on and uh, it, it can only happen if you have these genetic variants. Now you can get these genetic variants evolved later on. So whenever they switch on, it's an epigenetic factor. So you can have, for example, a car accident and suddenly these genes may be turned on. So you can start having migraines at age 50. It doesn't make any difference, but it has to be genetic. Interesting. And then there's just another comment. I know there's been a lot of discussion. So somebody's saying, what's the best place to get re refined salt without other ingredients? I mean, do you have a re brand recommendation or place to go to get your salt? I mean, what's the thought on that? I get the cheapest Morton salt that is iodized. Uh, I have no need for anything else because all I need is sodium chloride. And that's the perfect only sodium chloride. Yes, there is a little bit of, uh, what is it? That, that you put in it so that it can come through the machine and that it doesn't um, stick together in the humid air. That you're gonna find in it. You're gonna find that even in sugar. You're gonna find that everywhere. So this is unavoidable. Uh, I take the cheapest Martin salt. Really, that's all I take. Okay, well, that's that's, that's interesting because <laughs> sometimes uh, just the simple stuff keeps it easy. Angela, because we're running out of time now, and uh, let me ask uh, you. Where can people go to find out more information? Where, where, tell, tell us about your book. Uh, where's your website? Uh, so people have more interest on this because this is going to be published on YouTube. So if they want to know how to find out more about it. Okay. So uh, the, my original existing book is called Fighting the Migraine Epidemic Complete Guide. So look for the one that says Complete Guide, which is uh, the second edition. It's a white book. It's a very big one. That's what is currently in existence. And I'm working on another one now, which will be ketosis, not ketogenic diet, but ketosis, which will incorporate carnivore, ketogenic, as well as a low carb high fat for migraineurs very specifically. So that I hope to release by the end of this year. Finding me, uh, if you Google my name, Angela A. Stanton, PhD, make sure you put the A in and the PhD. Angela Stanton is a very common name. So you're gonna get a whole bunch of findings. But if you put in, Angela A. Stanton and Migraine, you're going to find all my websites. My main migraine website is uh, 
uh, StantonMigraineProtocol.com. And uh, you will find me on Facebook under my name, Angela A. Stanton or Angela Stanton, PhD. And uh, the group is uh, migraine sufferers who want to be cured by the Stanton Migraine Protocol. And there's a ketogenic, which I believe is the ketogenic uh, Stanton ketogenic diet or something like that. I don't want to remember the name. And if you want to get a hold of me on Twitter, my handle that is at migraine book. And uh, my email is Angela at migraine book.com. All right, perfect. Well, guys, I'm going to, unless somebody has some, he says, somebody said, I can see the talk gave their headache and they're kidding because <laughs> Angela, thank you so much. You're a great resource. Uh, hopefully, more people will utilize you and, uh, you can kind of put the end of migraines. So, because I know people, many, many people are pretty miserable. I've never, had, fortunately, never had one. And uh, I guess maybe I don't have the genetics for it. But yeah, I'm lucky you. <laughs> helpful for many, many people. Um, thank you guys for attending. Um, I'll be back tomorrow. Angelo, uh, hopefully, uh, after this coronavirus is all kind of run its course and, you know, it's, it's, the weather warms up, we can all get together for a barbecue or something here in the local. Yeah, definitely. We're going to try. Thank you for inviting me again. All right, guys, I'm going to shut it down, and we'll see everybody tomorrow, or a lot of you guys tomorrow. Take care, guys.